All right. So, um, let's see. I think that's about it, except for if you have questions, if you could, during the lecture, please use the chat option. And we will get to your questions after Savannah has completed her talk. And then afterwards, after that, of course, then we'll open it up so that anybody can ask questions as well. All right. So I'm going to hand it over now to Carrie, our volunteered program chair, and to hear about tonight's lecture. All right, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, it is my honor to introduce Savannah Carpenter. Savannah is an undergraduate student at the University of Utah, where she does research under Dr. Mark Lowen, focusing on ceratopsian dinosaurs from the late Cretaceous period of Southern Utah. Savannah has worked as an intern for the Natural History Museum of Utah since 2017, helping in both the paleontology collections and out in the field. Take it away, Savannah. Thank you so much, Carrie, for that awesome introduction. Um, and I just want to thank you all for having me tonight to be able to talk to you about these two new ceratopsians. Um, Mark and I have been working for the better part of three years now to describe and phylogenetically place these two new ceratopsians from southern Laramidia. Um, so it's a huge honor to be able to come and talk to you guys about that today. Um, and I'm also really excited because Utah Friends of Paleontology is a really awesome organization, right, because of its wide variety of people here in attendance. So um, people from like professional paleontologists to students trying to see if this is something that they want to pursue, um, members of the general public who just have a passion for dinosaurs, and even some kids in the room who are going to be our future generation of paleontologists. So um, for those of you in the room who are future paleontologists, a lot of paleontology is just learning all of the big new words that have to, you have to learn to go along with it. Um, so I said a couple of big words in that title, right? Ceratopsians. You might be thinking, what the heck is that, Savannah? Um, so for future paleontologists, here's your answer. Um, a ceratopsian is quadrupedal. So like all good charismatic mega fauna, it's kind of wandering around, lumbering around with all its weight on four legs. They are herbivorous. So you could think of them as like the hipsters of the Mesozoic, if you like. Ceratopsians have a beak. So very much like a bird today has. And they have these very fancy skull ornamentations on the back of their head, which we call a frill. Um, and you can see that demonstrated by this lovely lady in the middle who was on her way to the flower festival. And so now that we know what a ceratopsian even is, we can kind of get into more about how we classify these animals and put them into these subgroups. And at first glance, they might seem like the same dinosaur, obviously just flavors of horned dinosaur. Um, but by analyzing morphological traits that get preserved in the fossil record, um, we can actually begin to put these animals into very specific family trees. So fossilized traits like the shape of the narial region, is it uh, more round or more oblong? Also uh, things like the frill and how long it is relative to the rest of the skull. Um, so beyond this classification of just centrosaur versus chasmosaur, um, we can use more and more detailed anatomical traits to build more and more specific family trees. Um, and overall that helps us understand how ceratopsians evolved as a species, um, both temporally and geographically speaking. Um, we'll talk about a few chasmosaurs today, which will be denoted in blue. Um, but mainly we'll be focusing on the centrosaur side of the family because that's where our two new dinosaurs fit in and those will be denoted in yellow. And lastly, the last uh, key term for our future paleontologists of the room to learn tonight is Laramidia. Um, and Laramidia is the lost continent of dinosaurs. And to really understand that, you have to go back about 80 million years, right? So this puts us into the late Cretaceous. Um, at this point in time, Pangaea had already started to break up and the continents were sort of well on their way to looking like the way we see them now. However, um, sea levels were significantly higher in Lake Cretaceous than they are today. And so it causes this Western interior seaway, which you see just cutting through what is now North America. And it creates these two paleo continents. 
So on the left, you see the paleocontinent Laramidia, and on the right, the paleocontinent Appalachia. And luckily for us paleontologists, all we really have to do to get awesome dinosaur bone beds is to kind of just follow these coasts of ancient Laramidia. Um, and you can see that demonstrated here with some of our iconic dinosaur beds, which are labeled. So um, the Dinosaur Park uh, Formation and Two Medicine Formation up in Canada, the Judith River Formation in Montana, um, the Kaperowitz Formation, and of course the Waweep Formation here in Southern Utah, and the Fruitland Formation down in what is now Arizona. And because of the way these uh, paleo continents were arranged with the Western Interior Seaway cutting through the continent, Utah looked quite a bit different than it does today. So instead of these arid high desert environments that we're also used to here in Utah, it actually would have been more of like a coastal um, river delta type environment like you see in this depiction here. And the environments along this coastline would have been very swampy, like you see in this artist rendering. Um, we have some of our classic swamp animals, alligators, crocodiles, and of course some cute little duckbills uh, swamping through the mud in the background there. And this is significant to us as paleontologists because it makes Utah an excellent place to preserve horned dinosaurs, like this one that you see here, uh, slugging through the coastal delta mud. In fact, uh, Utah is such an exceptional depositional environment that we up at the Natural History Museum of Utah, just up on a foothill, are the home to the largest collection of uh, horned dinosaurs in the entire world, which is pretty cool. Um, and if you haven't gotten a chance to go see, I would definitely recommend because it's quite a sight to take in. Um, and we have our stars of today's talk, the centrosaurs hanging out on the left here and our chasmosaur friends on the right, just rounding out the rest of that ceratopsian family tree. Here we have another view of Laramidia. Um, this time it's actually a map view of ceratopsians. So you can see we have a pretty good range of different species spread throughout both the north and to the south. And to understand our two new species from the south and how they evolved into the phylogenetic placement that we put them in, um, we also needed to take a look at the centrosaurs from the north to get a full picture. So to do that, we looked at some dinosaurs from a variety of formations, including the Judith River Formation up in Montana. And the Judith River Formation is home to this animal here, so Ava ceratops. Um, Ava ceratops is about 77 million years of age. It's a relatively small species of ceratopsian. Um, it has a distinctive frill with a sort of curved squamosal here on the side of the cheek. And it lacks parietal fenestra, so holes in the frill, which means the frill is actually just a solid bone all the way through, which is kind of rare for a ceratopsian. Um, another awesome animal we have from the Judith River Formation that we were able to use data from was Medusa ceratops. Um, Medusa ceratops would have lived alongside Ava ceratops uh, about the same time and place in history. And this animal is historically placed with the uh, chasmosaur group, but because of how many epiparietals it has and how small its fenestrae or the holes in its frill are, um, it's actually thought to now be in with the centrosaurs. So kind of a contested figure, but still important to use in our phylogenetic analysis. And we also used a brand new species from Malta, Montana. Um, this is a, a species that is previously unknown and um, currently being described by Mark Lowen. So I will not go too much into this because that's like a, an entirely different UFOP talk, but still a cool animal to, to include. Um, we also looked to some animals from the foremost formation in Alberta, Canada, um, specifically animals like this guy, Xenoceratops foremostensis. Um, this animal is about 79 and a half million years of age, so a little older, and it has this unique frill orientation with the first epiparietals near the midline being kind of like short, knobbly-like projections going downwards. And overall, it's just a very spiky animal with horns all over its face and on the side of the face and over its eyes. Um, nearby, there's the Old Man Formation, which also has a pretty good centrosaur population for us to be able to use in our phylogenetic analysis. 
Um, that would include animals like this guy, Alberta ceratops. Um, and this is an interesting centrosaur because it has all centrosaurian features, except that it has these long horns over its eyes, which we usually would see in a chasmosaurian. Um, but everything else about it is a centrosaur animal, right? And it has this very robust nose ridge, um, making it pretty identifiable. And also from that old man formation in Alberta, we have Wendy Ceratops. Um, it also has this sort of upright nose horn, very notable brow horns, um, forward curving epiparietals up along the top of the margin of the frill. And a bit further to the south, we also look to the two medicine formation of Montana, which is home to Rubiosaurus, this sort of dramatic looking Ceratopsian with elongated epiparietal spikes and a pretty intense nose horn. And then of course, speaking of intense nose horns, uh, we have Ineosaurus here, um, who has this really unique nasal horn that actually curves forwards towards the animal's beak. So there's lots of centrosaurs from the north, which is awesome because that means that there's lots of information about this family tree and um, a lot of data for us to go off of up there. But in order to get the full picture of how these animals evolved and ended up with our two in the south, um, we also needed to fill in some missing puzzle pieces from our southern formations as well. So this took us to the scenic Moreno Hill formation over in New Mexico. And that is home to a really cool ceratopsian called Zuni ceratops. And Zuni ceratops was really fundamental for us to involve in our phylogenetic analysis. Um, it's a good 10 million years older than most of the other dinosaurs that we're discussing today. It's about 90 million years of age, so pretty old. And this animal exhibits a suite of morphological traits that are typical of primitive ceratopsians. Um, for example, it has double rooted teeth, a feature which um, is not present in later on ceratopsians. And we believe, or it is believed that this is actually not a chasmosaur or a centrosaur and is actually a dinosaur that occurred before that split in ceratopsians even occurred. Um, we also included some animals down in Arizona from the Fort Crittenden formation, um, specifically Crittenden ceratops, who's about 78 million years old, give or take. Um, and he can be distinguished by these forward curving hook-like flanges here up at the top of the frill and a pretty extensive epiparietals going along the sides and margins of the frill. And per perhaps most importantly, in the context of tonight's talk, um, we also needed to look to other centrosaurs recovered from the Wawip in order to place our two new dinosaurs that are from the Wawip formation. So some existing taxa from there that we looked at. Um, obviously, we had to start with Diabloceratops, an iconic part of Grand Staircase's legacy of dinosaurs. Um, Diabloceratops is about 80 million years old. And it's one of the most important species for us to look to in this phylogenetic analysis because it's thought to be the most basal of all centrosaurs, um, having occurred just after that split between centrosaurs and chasmosaurs. And you can kind of see that when we compare it side to side to protoceratops. So protoceratops is one of the most basal ceratopsians in the ceratopsian tree. And obviously, when you look at these two characters side by side, um, they're very different animals, but they do share some traits that are generally associated with being a more primitive ceratopsian. So things like this square squamosal over here on the side of its frill. Um, Diablo also had an accessory opening in its skull that actually becomes reduced and disappears in later ceratopsians, um, making it a pretty unique and cool character. And that brings us to another animal that was crucial for our phylogenetic analysis, uh, Machairoceratops. Machairoceratops was important to look at um, because not only is it from the same formation and timeline as our two new dinosaurs, but it also bears some striking uh, similarities to one of those new dinosaurs. Um, it has these exaggerated forward curving ornamentations along the top of its frill. And then if you notice, it actually has a blank space along the margin of the frill where there is no ornamentation. Um, and the ornamentation picks up later on along the sides of the squamosal, um, but there is no ornamentation up there between the first epiparietal and down there on the squamosal. 
And of course, we couldn't run a proper ceratopsy and phylogenetic analysis without including the legendary Kaparowitz formation. Um, this is another formation that represents a sort of coastal river floodplain depositional environment, um, very similar to the Louisiana Delta, for those of you who have visited there. And I say legendary because over 19 unique named taxa have come from Grand Staircase of Dinosaur, um, and we have plenty more on the docket. So it's a very enig enigmatic formation, um, and it has lots of good data for us to use for our phylogenetic analysis. So some of the ceratopsians found here include Utah Ceratops getii, which is a chasmosaur. Um, it's identifiable by a variety of traits, including its uh, nose horn, which is pretty far back on its face, and um, horns that um, are above the eye and extend laterally towards the animal's sides, which is sort of unique. Um, another chasmosaur from Grand Staircase is fan favorite Cosmoceratops, one of my favorites anyways, um, because it's got this iconic, it almost reminds me of like a comb over that it's doing with its frill, I think is really fun. And another centrosaur from Grand Staircase, Nisutoceratops, who is this really cool, almost like ox-like horns um, above its eyes, and a very unique ceratopsian trait, which is the presence of pneumatic elements in the nasal bones, which we don't actually see in other ceratopsians, so that's pretty neat. So overall, there's a very diverse and intricate speciation of ceratopsians occurring along the Lower Midian coastline at this time in the Cretaceous. Um, and many of these species that we just discussed were uncovered as part of the Kaparowitz Basin Project, which was a project launched in 2001. Um, and HMU and the U of U in partnership with all these awesome institutions you see here, um, just kind of setting out to understand what life was like in ancient Utah, um, particularly in the Kaparowitz Basin. Um, and work done as part of this project gave us a whole trove of data to work with, which was really awesome. We were able to stand on the shoulders of giants, as they say. Um, but to ensure the most complete phylogeny as possible, we um, needed to make sure that we coded for both published and known species, as well as unpublished and yet to be known species. So that led us to the beds on Tarantula Mesa. And this is a formation that is lateral to the Kaparowitz, um, but a bit older, we think, based on some of the sediment dating that has been done in that area. And the beds on Tar Tarantula Mesa produced this guy here. So this is currently just known as New Centrosaur Taxon A. Um, and it is very similar to Nasutoceratops. It has a ridge on its cheek like Nasuto does, um, but it has more epiparietals and actually has the longest horns of any known centrosaur. Um, we also included some unpublished specimens from the Kaparowitz formation. So things like new centrosaur taxon B um, would have looked like this in life. And here you can see some of the uh, fossilized material that we're working off with that one. Um, you can see it has lots of epiparietals and ornamentations along the margin of its frill, um, but it has pretty tiny fenestrae, little tiny holes in its skull and a pretty wide frill for a, a centrosaur as well. So that makes it different than Nasutoceratops because Nasuto has pretty large fenestra. Um, when you look at them both side by side at the same scale, you can see do have two different dinosaurs here. So we were able to use both of those in our phylogenetic analysis, which was pretty awesome. Um, there's also another new one that we are working with Denver on. And it's a, a chasmosaur that would have been very similar to Pentaceratops. Um, very notable long horns, very long frill. And the figure that you see in the corner um, shows the fossilized material that we have recovered so far in gold. And we actually have recovered um, a little bit more since this figure was done up. So some good stuff to look forward to in the future as far as more ceratopsians coming from staircase. And in life, it would have looked like this. And finally, we have our new specimens from the Waweep. So the moment we've all been waiting for, our guest of honor, and here he is. Isn't that a handsome frill? So this is our first new centrosaur that uh, we will be naming as part of this project. And this is a centrosaur we are very excited about because it is the oldest known centrosaur found in Utah. It's about 81.2 million years of age. 
Um, and it being the oldest recovered one, um, obviously is gonna give us some cool insight about the evolution of these dinosaurs um, through the late Cretaceous. Um, so this specimen is made up of this sort of M-shaped frill, which you see here. Um, we also have the dentary. You can see it here still in its fossil matrix with the uh, jacket around it. And we knew from comparing the morphological traits of the fossil material from a variety of centrosaurs um, that this new dinosaur would have had to have been pretty similar to Diabloceratops, um, which you can see. See here, they both have frills that sort of resemble like devil horns or rabbit ears. Um, however, they are different because our new centrosaur, Taxon A, which you see here on the right, um, is quite different from Diabloceratops because it only has one epiparietal at the top of the frill and no ornamentation along the margins, which you definitely see in Diabloceratops, which is pretty well decorated. Um, and the horns on our dinosaur are also shorter and more robust and um, just not quite as like long and lean as the Diabloceratops. So this brought us to another similar animal that it could be similar to. Um, this one I showed you earlier and that is Machyroceratops. And Machyroceratops also only has that one ornamentation on the top of its frill, followed by the blank space along the side. Um, however, as you can see, its parietals go pretty far forward instead of curving laterally like we see in our new Ceratopsian. So we're pretty confident in uh, naming this a new species. And so that guy would look like this. And I will pause for a second so you can take in his beauty. Maybe I'm biased. I think he's a pretty good looking dino. <laughs> And our second new dinosaur that we are naming is currently named Centrosaur Taxon C or Death Ridge because that's the region it was recovered from. Um, and it's made up of part of the animal's frill, which you can see here. And compared to our Taxon A or our Pilot Knoll Centrosaur, it may not seem like much skeletal material to go off of, um, but there is actually a suite of anatomical traits preserved here, which gives us uh, the ability to place it phylogenetically. So it has these lateral grill or lateral grooves on the back of its frill, and it also has a midline groove on the front side as well. Um, just one second. I think we've got, um, I think you need to re lost click story. on presenting. Someone else hit present, so I think it kicked you out. So do start Kick presenting. Me out. That's all right. <laughs> yeah. It would be a good virtual talk about some uh, technical difficulties. So. <laughs> yeah, just hit present a lot now today. Again. There you go. There you go. How's that? You're seeing uh, Ava Ceratops? Fantastic. Sorry about You're that, back. guys. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> so um, let me just go back a little bit. Um, we've got our centrosaur taxon C. Um, and like I was saying, it doesn't look like much, but it has these kind of grooves on the back and grooves on the front, which makes it um, pretty unique. Um, and we knew that this animal was similar to Avaceratops from the Judas River formation up in Montana, but the grooves that I just mentioned are not found in any Avaceratopsian at all. So that's how we know that this is something unique. And in life, would have looked something like this. Um, so I'll pause again for you to take in its glory. Very lovely dinosaur. <laughs> and when we fill in a strat column of all these centuries, Source. Um, you can see Pilot Knoll is actually at the very bottom here of the Waweep. And then if you look at the top of the Waweep formation, we have that Death Ridge Centrosaur. Um, so that's pretty neat because that means that the addition of these two new Centrosaurs extends the range of the Waweep completely and obviously sets back the timeline for the oldest known Centrosaur from the Waweep. And by reanalyzing the traits of existing taxa, um, unpublished taxa, and the two that we are in the process of publishing, we were actually able to build the most comprehensive Ceratopsian family tree to date using more traits than have ever been run before. Um, so we actually used 620 characters that we coded for and uh, 102 taxa. And it kind of looks like a, a lot when you're looking at the, uh, the family tree here, but when you scroll in, 
um, you get this kind of neat and tidy family tree with all the centrosaurs that we just talked about. So you see Diabloceratops in its very basal position at the top of the centrosaur tree. Um, and then moving forward, we have a kind of subgroup including Machairoceratops and our new centrosaur for, uh, from Pilot Knoll. And then, you know, further on through evolution, you get that Nesutoceratopsian group, which includes our Death Ridge centrosaur and all the Avaceratopsians. That's pretty cool. The naming and phylogenetic placement of these two new species of horned dinosaur is significant because it's helped us fill in this map of known centrosaurs along the coast of Laramidia. And it's helped us kind of put together the missing puzzle pieces needed to understand the whole story of how these dinosaurs evolved as a function of both time and geography. And of course, having two new horned dinosaurs to add to Utah's record-breaking collection, we are now a step closer to understanding the secrets of Ceratopsian evolution in ancient Utah. So I'd just like to thank you all for your time and um, now turn it over for any questions that you might have. Hey, hi. Thank you so much, Savannah. That was wonderful. I love seeing all of those um, Ceratopsians. There's a couple there that I that were named that I hadn't seen before. So this was wonderful. And uh, I know there's quite a diversity. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we do have one question in chat from Elaine. Elaine, do you mind just unmute and ask your question? Oh, sure. So, uh, it was uh, relating to oh yeah now you're gonna now you're gonna embarrass me so when was um, <laughs> Machaeoceratops uh, described I, I hadn't even heard of that one that one actually might be a newer species um, <laughs> as far as I know it's always been around but I don't know <laughs> wasn't it 2013 oh 2013 oh was it. As long as I've been studying ceratopsians, I've known of it, but I'm still new to paleontology, so <laughs> maybe I'm newer yeah. than Makairo. Cool dinosaur. So uh, also, uh, somebody, Sarah Campagna is asking, who did all, what, all of this wonderful art? So most of this art is done by Andre Atuchin, who is a very talented paleo artist. Very lucky to have him. Excellent. And uh, Hillary McLean says, two new species from the Waweep. What a time to be alive. <laughs> Which is cool. Right? right? Yes. I'm just so excited to have more to add to Grand Staircase's legacy. Yeah. And then we have a question from Juan Camilo Beltran, who says, thanks very much for this fantastic talk. And he's got two questions. The first, the ornamentation and the characters of the skulls. I think they are very important. So other types of bones such as vertebrae can be used to make the classification? Yeah, so when we have uh, vertebrae or like limb bones, we can code for those. We do have sections where we can code. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of the time we don't get those things preserved. A lot of the dinosaurs that I worked on this semester for coding, um, I was literally just going off of like a frill bone. And so you can really only answer things regarding what you have. Um, and you can maybe make some conjecture of what you might have based on some evidence. Um, but for the most part, all of these were categorized using um, material from the skull instead of postcranial. And then his second question is, given the occurrences you showed, can we speak of endemism in this group? I'm sorry, I think I mispronounced that. E-N-D-E-M. ISM. Um, gosh, and I, I'm blanking now. Are, are you are you meaning like it moving throughout space and traveling, or just staying like endemic to one area rather than being more cosmopolitan? I think that's how I'm understanding it. Um, and we do think that Ceratopsians sort of radiated from the north and then came south. And so you'll have some overlap of species here and species there. But for the most part, as they travel, they'll speciate. So that's why we have like Avaceratops up in the Judith River formation. Um, and then, you know, very similar Centrosaur Taxon C, which is further south. So you can see like they evolved from the same, you know, grandfather Ceratopsian maybe, but as they've traveled, have speciated and kind of lost that endemic. 
quality. Mm. And it looks like Juan, is this you saying you're joining us from Bogota in Colombia? That's cool. Oh, um, awesome. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> We're getting getting very international here now. And then Dan Danielle Montague Judd is asking what kind of kinds of characters did you find to be the most useful in your analysis? So anything with frill, anything with epiparietals, so these little ornamentations up here is basically gold mine. If you're looking for a ceratopsian in a ceratopsian bed, that's what really gives you a lot of the good data, um, especially for how Mark and I have structured our family trees. It's basically around the frill. Um, so yeah, I would say epiparietal and frill is very important. Okay. And then BJ Nichols is asking with over 600 characters, how does that work with minimal material like the new taxon from with just the frill material? Yeah, so we have a big Excel spreadsheet where we've got um, all of our taxon, you know, going down like the Y axis, as it were, and across the X axis, we have like 620 traits and we just go through and code. And so it'll be, you know, things about the frill, things about the leg bone, this and that. And if it's something that we don't have information on, um, we'll just put a dash. If it's something that we aren't quite sure about, we'll put a question mark. Um, and then there's usually different traits that correspond to like zeros, ones, and twos. So I just end up with this huge Excel spreadsheet of zeros, ones, twos, and then dashes for things that we just can't code for. And luckily our computer program is smart enough to filter through that and um, ignore things that we don't have ability to, to make conjecture about. And Nathan Nong says, great talk. And did the addition of these new taxa or these or those new ceratopsian characters change or further resolve existing ceratopsian phylogenies? They did, yeah. So we've been kind of rerunning our tree, trying to get it just right. And I can even see like from the tree that I have from the beginning of the semester to the one I have now, um, definitely changes the branches quite a bit. So um, I would say, yeah, <laughs> by, by now we have what we think is pretty close, but it obviously has changed the existing phylogeny of all the other dinosaurs. So Someone else will come along and find a new dinosaur and it'll change my phylogeny. <laughs> <laughs> so it goes. And Don DeBlois says, thanks for working on the pilot no Noel Ceratopsian. And, oh, thanks, Don. <laughs> yeah, and Jeff Alvarez says, can you briefly explain how it is decided that a dinosaur is a unique new species and not just a different version of an existing dinosaur? So this is the great part about paleontology. Um, a new dinosaur is a new dinosaur if a qualified paleontologist said so. <laughs> so as you can see, that leaves a lot of space for argumentation and debate, which is what we paleontologists do best. <laughs> so I could very easily say this is a different species and somebody else could come along and say, no, I think that is Avaceratops and the Fenestrae just change um, with ontogeny. Um, but we don't think that, darn it. So you'll have to write a different paper to argue with me about it. <laughs> and and Hillary McLean, Elaine, Hillary's, um, if you look in the chat, there's a reference to a paper that's describing the dinosaur you asked about. I saw that. I'm going to look it up. Yeah. Thanks, great. Hillary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for a moment there. I was like, I don't know. The car is has been longer round than me. Yeah. So. <laughs> Robert is asking, did Macariceratops have those spikes at the top of its frills? Yeah, so it's very similar to the pilot knoll, which you're looking at here on the left, except instead of um, the M-shaped, almost like McDonald's logo frill going lateral, it goes forward. So it's got these forward, forward leaning epiparietals instead. Well, huh. actually, um, I don't know if you can pull that picture up, up again of that. Ceratops, but uh, I was actually uh, Makairo or yeah, Makairo. Sorry, go ahead. I did not mean to interrupt you. <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, oh, wait, I think that well, yeah, that was one of the ones I was talking about. Uh, I was wondering, uh, from digging on the field, uh, 
Have you found the skull with those spines pointing out like that? No, I did not get to work on Machairoceratops. I guess I wouldn't have been able to because I would have been like a little child when <laughs> they were pulling this guy out of the ground. Um, but yeah, from what I know, those are actually pretty well, pretty well preserved on the specimen, I believe. Uh, and there was actually another one that I think I've, I was actually wanted to talk about as well. That other one that had that, that hair, that hairstyle on its, at the top of its. Oh, <laughs> Cosmoceratops. Uh, Cosmoceratops. Yeah, his yes. frill reminds me of like Donald Trump or something. Um, no yeah. offense to Cosmoceratops. I, I meant to ask. Uh, <laughs> I meant to, what, yes, that one. That one. Uh, I meant to ask. Uh, has anyone actually seen a skull or any any specimen with with those? those spines pointing out like that i mean how do you know yeah. that it actually had those yeah i am lucky enough to have gotten to work at the natural history museum where this is actually housed um and it's actually a very beautiful specimen um and so those are are preserved in it which is really great but if we had lost them um during the preservation process we might be able to guess they were there based on just like the connection points um but it would have been a lot harder to prove obviously so we're, we're very lucky when things preserve um with great detail like that all right so i guess so i'm guessing this this one specifically is just another piece of paleo art um i mean the like the blue color for instance is the paleo art we have no way of saying this dinosaur was blue um but we do know that it had a frill like that with the the comb over that did get preserved. So yeah, really neat specimen. It's one of my favorites. Yeah, it's one of mine. And and Robert, I've actually seen the holotype of that skull in um at the museum in their collections. It's it's pretty amazing and it's pretty intact also. Oh hi. Hi. so yeah. I've got to move to Utah someday. <laughs> you got to come visit. You got it. Robert. We've got yeah. all the good yeah, dinos here. Beautiful skull. Beautiful. Yeah, it is. It's just a gorgeous skull. Uh, maybe we'll dig out a picture and post it on our Facebook page so you can see it. Um, I'll keep an eye out. Yeah. So Jim Kirkland says, point of interest, Mike Getty found Centrosaurus species C on the first trip to the Grand Staircase that either he or Scott Sampson made. And Elaine commented on that and said, Ron, for, which is- And I was wrong. Husband, was with Mike Getty. What? Well, this, this I was, was like wrong. It, was, it, it wasn't that, it wasn't that animal. If you, if you uh, go further down the chat, we- Oh, okay. Said, uh, well, Jim, Jim and Mark Lowen and I were going back and forth, but uh, Ron was with Mike when he found a couple of others, including Utah Ceratops, but not that one. Okay. I had a great picture of Scott and Mike holding that frill. Almost the entire <laughs> thing was laying on the ground. Cool. Uh, you I see thought the, I almost included it. <laughs> should have. <laughs> I should have, yeah. That was such a cute picture of young Scott and young Mike. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Got a kick out of that. Yeah, Mark yes. and I were talking yesterday how neither he or I will ever go to that site again. <laughs> oh, that fun to hike to, huh? It's a straight up climb up a boulder rubble uh, notch where we had to like find our way around house size rocks. <laughs> oh, was was but, this the one where they would, was a rock saw involved in this one for getting it out? No, no, no. It was laying on the okay. ground. <laughs> Put it in their pack and carried it out. Okay, because I, I know I know Ron has been up on Death Ridge, but it must have been for some other uh, uh, particular exploration. <laughs> Yeah, Mark, you would know. Uh, did uh, those guys go ever go back out there to that site? Yeah, the site was rediscovered um, <clears throat> in November of oh. 2019, <clears throat> and they found more ceratopsian material and more crocodile material. Um, so there were plans to go back during 2020, but obviously uh, that didn't happen. <laughs> so no maybe figure. this summer. But we don't think there's any more of the specimen. But we did. We uh, were yeah. able to place it in the section. Uh, we were taken. They were going to show us the ceratopsian. It turned out to be a dinosuchus. <laughs> uh, uh, Getty got bored, went out and found that in that jaw, or maybe Scott found the jaw of that lambiosaur. 
area. Never. Okay, yeah. so <laughs> <laughs> we do have some more questions here. So, Sarah Campagna is saying, "Sorry, I'm madly trying to look this up, but what are the basic differences between Casmosars and Centrosars?" Savannah. Gosh, sorry, my me? internet connection is. Uh, sorry, my We're internet is in and out. Uh, well, we're asking the. Can you hear me? <laughs> yep, I, I, I hear, hear you. you. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Let me try that. Okay. Sorry, guys. That's I would have right. some internet issues. I'm glad it waited till the end of my talk. Um, yeah. <laughs> Gina, if you don't mind asking that again for me. Okay, sure. What are the basic differences between Cosmosaurs and Centrosaurs? Yeah, so Chasmosaurs um, and Centrosaurs can be differentiated by um, like the, the nose opening, like I showed in one of those slides. Um, so oblong versus circular. Um, and they also have different frill lengths. So um, frills would be much longer relative to skull length in the Chasmosaurs than they are in the Centrosaurs. Um, so they're all pretty small details. Like I said, they look pretty similar at first glance, but. Okay. And Joshua Lively is saying the pilot knoll animal has epi epiparietal ones that look like those on Medusa ceratops to a Mosasaur dude. Are those on Medusa a different ossification? Savannah? You with us? I am so sorry. The internet okay. is just cutting in and out. Um, for those of you who are watching this talk who are inside my house, if you don't mind uh, leaving the talks, <laughs> I have more bandwidth. Um, if you don't mind repeating that last question one more time for me. Sure. So Joshua Lively asked, the pilot knoll animal has epipar epiparietal ones that look like those on Medusa ceratops to a Mosasaur dude. Are those on Medusa a different ossification? Um, on Medusa is similar to a Mosasaur, is that what you said? Um, that's my kind of red. Joshua, yeah. you wanna hop in? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It was like so, a Mosasaur. Uh, yeah. I was saying, yeah, to a Mosasaur dude, uh, Epiparietal one on uh, that uh, uh, new um, pilot knoll uh, critter look to me a lot like Medusa ceratops. Um, is that a different? Uh, okay, so maybe that is that epiparietal two on Medusa ceratops? Then uh, is that a different? Yes, yeah, yeah. Epiparietal one is that kind of lackluster thing in the middle, um, and then the other main difference is that Medusa does have the extra epiparietals along the frill, whereas the pilot knoll just has that blank space there. Um, it does have more um, pickup along the squamosal, but it just has the one epiparietal as far as parietal part of the school, the school goes. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah. It just, uh, to me, it looks like you took Medusa ceratops's um, epiparietal two, I guess, and moved it up into the one. Moved uh, it up. Yeah. Uh, so it's kind of, kind of <laughs> neat convergence, I guess. Uh, awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Josh. Right. So I'm going to combine this next questions from Brooks Dame and Robert Peterson, who are basically asking, how did you get started with paleontology? And what suggestions do you have for undergrad students to get their feet in the door for paleontology? What courses, yeah. et cetera? That's a great question. Um, so I was very lucky to kind of start out my life as a museum kid, as it were. So I spent all of my time at the summer camps at the museum and things like that. Um, and then as soon as I turned 18, I just wanted to start volunteering and doing um, field work. Um, and then I actually started doing field work with the Natural History Museum a couple of years ago. Um, and I say that because I started as a volunteer, but once I was volunteering, you know, Carrie asked if I wanted to come be a collections intern. And then I did that for a while. And then Mark asked if I wanted to start doing research. And so it's all been like a lot of really awesome opportunities that came just from that seat of volunteering. And so that's where I always tell people to start is I think that's a really awesome way to, you know, cut your teeth in citizen science and get your foot in the door. 
Um, as far as classes go, I think the University of Utah is a really great space to study paleontology. They have a lot of good like vertebrate paleontology stuff. Um, but yeah, just keep your interest in geology and, and keep your eyes open when you're hiking and ask lots of questions. Yeah, that was a wonderful, wonderful story, Savannah. And, Thanks, Robert. You know, you know, in which that kind of remo kind of reminds me. Um, you know, I do I do live in the Appalachia and the Appalachia region, but um, I do live closer to the Smithsonian in DC. And there was there was a program that I did sign up for. It was a paleobiology training program, which unfortunately it did it did get canceled last year, but. Uh -huh. um, just, but I have been making up for that for by taking classes on Coursera with, you know, Phil Curry. I don't know if you've heard of that. Yeah, actually, I did that one while I was uh, still in community college. I love, I loved that that module by Phil Curry. So that's another good one, you guys. Phil Curry does a free a free module class. Okay. So also, um, just Jim, Hillary McLean's asking if you can share the picture of Scott and um, Getty, maybe in the Getty Sphere Memorial Facebook page. She'd like to see it. And then Xander Rex is asking, has, been, has there been any evidence for emitting ceratopsians to being isolated into northern and southern populations? They diversify into their own unique frill styles, like a mountain range in the middle of the continent. So there is definitely like a cluster up north and a cluster down south. Um, and I wish I had a better answer <laughs> for you about that because I just have spent all my time focusing on the wall weep down there. So I don't even know what's happening up north to create that. But um, there is definitely some clustering. Um, another thing to keep in mind though, is that sometimes you might be missing data just because we haven't found data. So you could very well go find a ceratopsian at some point, they would change that. Yeah, Mark, give them your theory. I like it. <laughs> There's actually a place in Wyoming where Geologically, we can prove that the ocean comes up against cliffs and the cliffs are calving chunks of cliff off into the deep lower shore phase, below storm wave phase. So at that point, just south of Kimmerer, Wyoming, the water lap the cliffs is at least 50 feet deep. So that's one place where you cannot walk the beach from south to north. But that's one place at one instant in time. Um, but yeah, there there seem to be some geologic barriers between Montana and Utah in Idaho. Idaho is a nasty place with a lot of mountains and a lot of ridges. And yeah, <laughs> that's, that's what we have to say. Yeah, and even here. Yeah, it's, it's like, we'd love yeah. to get a student involved in a master's project proving this. Um, and it's true. Well, there's a nature paper there. <laughs> <laughs> so then, um, now this, I guess, would go out in general to a lot of uh, the paleontologists here. But Sid Perks is asking, any idea of when field work will start up again? Anybody want to hop in on that one? Savannah? <laughs> oh Any gosh. <laughs> I wish it was now. Carrie. Where's Carrie? I have no idea. I know yeah, you can go Carrie? bug Josh Lively and go do some work down for the Price Museum. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to Dalton Wells Monday. <laughs> Den Denver snuck down to New Mexico a couple weeks ago, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Hey, Mark, Mark, you might not tell people that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and from what Tyler, well, from what Tyler was saying is uh, the museum has to follow the lead of the university, mm -hmm. and the university's kind of they. It looks like they're just kind of holding off for the semester, so it'll probably be fall before there's a field season. Yeah, we um, have a uh, uh, stay-at-home orders for, uh, from May and June. So we have to follow the University of Utah, but after June, maybe. So we'll be in touch. Cool. 
Yeah, we hope to be out for a few weeks this summer. Uh, but I definitely want people to have had their shots. Well, I, my whole team has already got two shots. Yay! Uh, uh, my students, though, that's for sure. <laughs> All right. So then we have another question. We've got some more questions here. So Renzo right, Alejandro Garavito Camacho is saying, hi, thanks for the talk. I would like to know how in studies with limited material it is possible to differentiate between the phylogenic or ontogenetic nature of the traits? Yes, that's the uh, the great debate. So I gave this a, a version of this talk uh, in Malta, Montana, um, a little over a year ago, and was harassed a little bit afterwards by Jack Horner, who <laughs> definitely <laughs> feels a different way about holes in frills than we do. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where like you could come along with more science and disprove my science. And I, I encourage the next generation to do that. Um, but, you know, we're going off of different species for these things instead of saying ontogeny. Um, but, you know, higher triceratops debate, I guess. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. So you then know, speaking of, you know, speaking of horns and frills, uh, I did have, I did, I may have asked this question in an, Another talk I was involved in yesterday with Joe, with Joe Sirtis and the Denver Museum. Uh, I was wondering, um, with uh, with the horns and frills in some ceratopsians, especially Chasmosaurus, from when I used to watch Planet Dinosaur, did those holes make did those holes make the frills kind of fragile, too fragile for facing off against Tyrannosaurids? Yeah, I mean, we've all seen that classic, like, paleo art, right, of a triceratops, like, with a tooth through the, the frill. Um, but it's very similar to the fenestrae and the frill would be very similar to, like, the fenestrae in your skull. So if you put your fingers, you know, by your eyeballs and pretend to chew bubble gum, you can kind of feel this hole moving. Um, and so that, that is a hole in your skull, but it's filled in with, like, muscles and all sorts of goods. And so it they wouldn't have been walking around with, like, you know, super fragile spots. It, it would have been, you know, pretty, pretty covered. Now, there's a real neat centrosaur frill at the National Museum of Canada, where when you look at the inside margin of the frill, you see these points coming out all the way around both sides, both openings. And you can see that's from tendons ossifying. So I think of it almost like a tennis racket, that these things brought in connective tissues across it that gave the whole thing a lot more strength than without them. So we really have to think of these things as being more than just the bone. Uh, uh, someone should write that specimen up. That's a that's pretty low hanging fruit. <laughs> so um, a lot of people saying great job, um, Savannah, which I think we can all agree on. And Sarah Companions pointing out that she just heard someone from Royal Tyrell say that they weren't going to be doing anything again this summer. So I guess not there either. And Robert Peterson is saying, what was the name of Curie's module again? Oh, you have to look it up. It's on Coursera. Um, Gosh, it's been a few years since I took it, and I wanted to say World of Dinosaurs because that's what Mark and I teach. Um, <laughs> it's something in that same vein. It might just be Intro to Paleontology, actually. I think uh, it's called it's Dino 101. Dino 101. There you go. Yes. And there's okay. also one on theropod, theropods and birds, and there's early vertebrate evolution and, marine, and also marine reptiles. And there's also another course I just discovered on a place called edx.org, and it's called Dinosaur systems, uh, dinosaur ecosystems, and it's taught by uh, some by two paleontologists in China. One was called Michael Pittman, and Xu Xing. His name is spelled X U, and then X U I I N G. And they teach at the University of Hong Kong. And I'm currently Ooh, enrolled cool. in that one. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, and Christina Douglas just posted a link for the Coursera in the chat. So if somebody wants to go mm. link and copy that, that's a good one. So once again, lots of people saying thank you. And BJ says, great talk. 
And I think I have to agree. That's wonderful. Yes. Any other Thank questions? Thank you so much. People, just feel free to unmute and ask Savannah. Uh, Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, I did ask another one. You said, going back to what you said about Zunoceratops possibly not being either a centrosaur or a chasmosaur, yeah. is, there a, is there a third subfamily that groups early ceratopsians at the moment? Um, no. So that was kind of more like a linear thing with the earlier ceratopsians. And then we get the split that occurs after Zuni ceratops. So um, Zuni's not quite as basal as that proto ceratops, but he's not quite evolved enough to, to be going after that split. Yeah, it's kind of a stem right between the split, right before the split. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, sorry. <clears throat> what are some of the biggest misconceptions you have constantly have to communicate to children and the public about ceratopsians? <laughs> Ooh, that's a good one. People always think that they're fighting with these ornamentations and we just don't have the evidence to back that um it's more likely that they're just sexy they're just you know you're like i want to mate with that that's a good looking frill and <laughs> bada bing yeah, you know yep yeah. <laughs> yes yes thank thank recently i've there's recently been one misconception that i've i've had in mind for some time after I after I watched a talk by Dave Holmes about mm -hmm. about tyrannosaurs, and that would be that I'm sure that you know all of us have seen paleo art or a film or documentary that features a full grown T Rex fighting a full grown Triceratops, in which even I, even I as a child and teenager I fell into that trap and always wanted to see that fight, especially in Jurassic Park, and so that, so as much as I like to think about that seeing that i've actually now look at you know juveniles being targeted now so i think maybe that may be one misconception you could you could maybe give to the public that you know juveniles ceratopsians are have maybe were targeted more than full-grown adult ceratopsians and it's even shown in copper and coprolite findings indeed <laughs> Yeah, you know, they probably went for the old ones that were, you know, broken leg, you know, dragging a leg along. You know, it's like when you have a hurt fish, all of a sudden the sharks come out and nail it. You know, it's hurt. You know, you have some big ceratopsian getting ready to die. You know, whoever gets to kill it gets the liver. <laughs> also <laughs> true. <laughs> oh, well. Anyone else? Well, if you if you're not unmuted already, let's unmute so we can give a big hand to Savannah. Thank you so much. Thank you for talking about my favorite dinosaurs. <laughs> Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah. yeah. Goodbye, everyone, yeah. and we'll see you again next month. Don't right. worry, we'll announce somebody between now and then. Oh, uh, Savannah, right. do you have okay. any? Do you have a okay. website in case we have further questions to ask you? You know, I am Pleisto Queen on Instagram, but I am not.